Today, we're speaking with Dr. Kate Domit, who is a senior lecturer at the Public Understanding of Politics at the University of Sheffield in the UK. Dr. Kate Domit's recent research has looked at the rise of political advertising on Facebook, um, the way that political parties are using digital technology, and how regulators are responding to rapid technological change. And so we hope you enjoy this conversation with Dr. Kate Domit. Could you talk a bit about sort of how the debate around um, advertising transparency, political ads have evolved over the past sort of year, how your work has sort of fit into that evolution? Yeah, so I think that the issue of mark targeting and specifically what's acceptable around that has really gained a lot of new focus. I think, you know, we saw this issue come onto the debate around 2016 and this growing public awareness that micro-targeting was happening and a, a real feeling that, you know, maybe some of the practices that we were seeing around data use weren't acceptable. So there were a lot of concerns voiced by a range of different organisations and like policy groups about, you know, whether it was okay for firstly data to be used without people's consent um, whether we were kind of comfortable with only very small groups of people being targeted with specific messages. Um, but also, you know, whether, what impact were these mark targeting activities having? Uh, and particularly, you know, is there potential for people to be manipulated or to, um, you know, be affected by certain material, whether that's preventing people from going out to vote by, you know, persuading them that it doesn't matter or that their vote is worthless. So there are a whole lot of questions about like what is happening, you know, what are the foundations of, of this work and, um, and actually are we happy with the consequences of what it is? And I think the thing that um, the debates that as they've evolved has really been that we don't know the answer to a lot of these questions. I think what from my perspective and what I've been interested in my work is actually looking at what is specifically new about micro-targeting today. Um, because micro-targeting is a practice that is very well established um, around elections. You know, the use of data to run get out the vote operations where campaigners, you know, go and knock on doors, they find their voters and then they mobilise them at election. It's really well established and political parties have long had access to certain kinds of data like the electoral roll. But there is something new going on um, and that's specifically about the access that digital technology provides uh, in terms of new sources of data about people. And really importantly, there are questions around people's ability to give consent to that data. So, you know, whether that's information that's being collected from your social media profile or your shopping habits, it's possible for political campaigners to gather that data and to utilize it to target you with messages without your knowledge and understanding. And that's raised a whole range of questions for policymakers. So in the work that I've been doing, it's been trying to really pin down well, what is the issue with mark targeting, you know, and, and specifically how is digital mark targeting different from what's come before, but then also to think about what we might want to do about some of this. Um, and part of that is actually trying to offer some clarity about which practices are acceptable and which are less acceptable. So there are certain forms of data which you know it's widely established that they're they're okay to use within a democracy because they help mobilize people and they drive political engagement but there's other forms of data that we're going to be less comfortable with being used and it's there that we need regulation so it's trying to really think about those distinctions um, and then also think about the other things that we might want to do around micro targeting and i think that brings us to some really interesting debates about transparency and what voters and what kind of other actors like civil society organizations need to know about micro-targeting in order for it to be a valid activity. Can you give examples of um, the types of data that kind of are acceptable and long used to, um, in, in campaigns and then also what are kind of examples of new forms of data that are collected and used? Yeah so I think that this is kind of something that I've tried to do in a bit of my work is classify the different forms of data so there's some data that is kind of like publicly available and in the public realm and it's freely available to parties. So that's stuff like the electoral roll. So this is a kind of list of everyone who's registered to vote in the UK and you can kind of go on and it's just got your name and address and, and political organisations use that as a way to um, know who to reach out to at elections. 
There's also something called the marked register, which basically tells you whether people actually then turned up to vote. So it indicates, you know, who's voting and who's not voting. It doesn't tell you how they vote. Um, then some of the other data that is widely established and used is, is canvassing data. So that's where political parties, you know, they might go out and knock on your door. They might ask you to sign a petition and try and gauge your interest in particular issues. But they're essentially trying to get some information about where you sit on the political spectrum and how likely you are to vote for that particular party. So, you know, if someone knocks on your door and you tell them that you're a Labour voter, what um, political parties do is they record that information and they pair it up with the information that they get from the electoral roll so that they build up what's called a voter profile, which is essentially a list of people who they think are their supporters and who are likely to vote for them and then people who are not supporters. And, you know, they focus on election day on getting the people they think are their supporters to go out and vote. And these are really established activities. But there's some questions about other forms of data. So, and I think this comes about, there's two categories here that I think it's useful to think about. So that's, you know, data that is like private data that often um, political parties have to purchase. Um, and then there's kind of data that's inferred about us so that we don't directly give it to um, political parties, but they um, make inferences about our ideas and preferences and use that to build a profile of us. So interestingly, in the past, some forms of commercial data have been used by parties. So we've seen over recent years, political parties buying data from companies like Experian, for example. Now, Experian are a credit um, checking agency and they create categories of kind of you know older people younger voters and these models are used to build up a profile of people and what their likely interests are based on you know a lot of commercially gathered information about us now prior to gdpr the use of that data has been very well accepted but it's becoming um it, there's real questions about the acceptability of the use of that data at the moment and i'm certainly seeing indications that a number of political parties have stopped using experian data because of gdpr so there's that kind of data and there are questions about how we feel about that because people don't consent to that being given and they often don't know that it's being given but then what's really new is this kind of um inferred data that's coming from social media companies so you know i think the example that's often cited is the information that's used about facebook um so for facebook advertising which political parties can take a list of names that they've got off the electoral roll so that's freely available data they can upload it into facebook and facebook can tell you uh you know what interests those people who you've uploaded have and then they can find similar voters there's this look-alike function that facebook have so in that situation you know you're using publicly available data but you're supplementing it with all of this data about people's interests that they've maybe disclosed to a private company on platform not knowing that data is going to be used for political purposes but then also companies like facebook do make inferences about your um, interests and beliefs and and historically your political views and that can be used um, to target you with messages now, it's important to notice that um, Facebook as a company have actually changed the kind of criteria in which political actors are able to target people on Facebook because of a lot of public outcry and I think that that really shows you how there's a real debate about what data it is acceptable or not acceptable to use. I'm curious um, because at PI you know we work on advertising transparency and, and mm -hmm. trying to understand what information is should be required to tell people about why they're seeing the ads that they're seeing and the content that they're seeing. But I'm curious, could you just talk briefly about um, like what political ads are? How the data that's flown into those systems, especially on Facebook, um, is then used to target the, the ads themselves? Yeah, so political adverts, it's a kind of a bit of a minefield because there's a whole basic question about what counts as a political ad. Um, and I think, you know, historically, we've thought about political adverts like billboards or kind of television um, uh, party broadcasts, which are like heavily regulated things in the UK system. But online, they are not regulated at all. And um, this is a huge gap in electoral law. So what we've seen is that different platforms have defined what a political ad is in different ways. So Facebook have quite an expansive definition of political adverts which includes material from political parties or campaigners. 
but also kind of issues about social and political issues. Um, whereas Google only includes as political ads, ads from candidates or parties. So it's a much smaller definition of, of what's going on. But what's interesting about these adverts is that um, whereas a kind of billboard is just up, everyone can see it, you know, you walk past it, not everyone will see it, but there's, an, there's a possibility that you can see that advert. What happens online is that some adverts can be placed to everyone and given to a generic audience, but where advertisers online are making their money is the ability to allow advertisers to reach out to potentially very small groups of voters. So say that you were the Conservative Party and you had a message that you thought was really going to mobilise um, over 65s to vote and you had a very specific message that was about you know their particular interest in immigration issues but you only wanted to speak to a small number of people in a particular constituency then what the data that these companies provide allows is you know they have the platform and the data about individuals to focus a specific message on a specific target group and as i was kind of saying before that data is often not given with people's understanding of of the fact that you know if you put on facebook that you like fishing or you know that you're particular you have very nationalistic sentiments for example that could be used to target you with a specific message and most people don't think about what they post to their friends uh, as as giving away information that can be used to target them with advertising so it's a really different model of how we are coming to see political messages and although public understanding of online advertising has increased since 2016 you know large numbers of people still don't know how it operates and even people who do know how it operates feel pretty powerless in the face of what they can do about this because relatively few of these platforms provide ways for us to be able to opt out of seeing this form of advertising so it can be quite invasive i think the other thing to note is that online there isn't a kind of repository of all adverts and until some companies in relatively recent history started creating um, archives of online political advertisements we had no idea what was happening online so whereas you know you could technically gather up leaflets or you could go and kind of look at what was on a billboard and you knew that was being regulated there was a complete wild west online you know we didn't know what was happening we didn't know if the content was divisive or problematic. Um, so online advertising is quite different and that's why we've seen really um, sustained calls for regulation. So from here, I think it might be interesting to hear more about your work on micro-targeting because that's a, a big part of how the ads are actually shown to people. Um, and maybe you could start by just talking about what your definition, how you even understand micro-targeting. Uh, I think the definition of micro-targeting is really difficult actually. I think it's, um, it's so challenging because we're not kind of dealing with a uniform um, like object when we're thinking about micro-targeting. So if you're looking at a local election, for example, in a particular ward, um, then micro-targeting in that context is going to be maybe sending an advert to you know, 50 to 100 people. Um, but if you're thinking about a constituency, then, you could have a much larger number of people because there are, you know, the same percentage of the overall, but it would still be micro-targeting because if, you know, if, if essentially kind of one or two percent of people are seeing uh, a particular message, mm -hmm. then the actual number can vary, but it's about the percentage. And I kind of think that for my own purposes, I tend to think, you know, it's, there isn't a, a clear benchmark that you can put in and go, right, if it's less than 20 percent, then that's micro-targeting. But I do think that it is worth thinking about, you know, how extensive would a message need to be before uh, you start to think about it as not being seen by a majority? You know, so potentially anything under 50% could count as a form of targeting. But I think for me, micro-targeting is when you really get down to those small granular communities. Um, so we are talking about much smaller numbers of people seeing content. Uh, transparency is absolutely key um, and I think that you know this is 
it's, it's important to say we're talking about transparency at two levels, right? There's transparency for the individual user, so what your average person sees, and then there's transparency almost to you know, academics and experts and researchers who can then dig in. Now, I think with the transparency to the user, we've seen a real focus on this. This is partly because actually Facebook has taken the decision to increase transparency itself. Um, they've created a why am I seeing this advert um, option in the corner of adverts that you can click on and you can see, you know, actually now where the data that the advert is based on was uploaded. Um, and there's some basic information about why you're seeing this ad about the targeting criteria. But the fact that they've made some movement should be praised, but there are a lot of problems with what they've done. And I think actually it serves to show why it's so important to talk about transparency and what meaningful transparency looks like. Because transparency sounds like a great thing, but it's one of those great terms that sounds really good, but only is meaningful when you're very, very precise about what information is being put in the public realm and what form that information needs to come in in order to make it intelligible to people and actually useful. Uh, and I think with a lot of the changes that Facebook have been making, they're providing more information, but some of it is so vague that it's actually not useful. So you might see, for example, when you click on their um, button, it says, you know, this advert has been targeted to 18 to 24 year olds who are interested in clothes. Now, that might not actually be the precise criteria that you were targeted on. It might be that they know that I've recently shopped at Monsoon and you know I've, I regularly make purchases online uh, for clothing and that's why I'm seeing it. And it, it might similarly be something that you know, they think that it's not actually to do with fashion. It could be to do with something else entirely and they're interested in reaching out to young women who maybe have a certain political leaning but they're telling me it's about fashion. And I have no way of knowing actually what the intentions of the advertiser were when they decided to select the criteria that ended up with that ad in front of me. And that's really problematic because it means that as a user, I'm not able to judge like what the advert is trying to do. And we need that contextual information in order to be able to understand and to be able to process and make good decisions about what about how we interact with this material we're being presented with. So with that in mind, I think, you know, current debates around transparency, there, there is a consensus in the policy community that we need this, but we need much more action to kind of go, right, well, what does that transparency look like? And how what might we then design that in a way that's actually useful for the user? And I think there's, this is important because there's a lot of different kind of information that we could be given. So we could be given information about who is financing that political advert. We could be given information about the source of that political advert and actually who is trying to influence it. We could be given information about the data that has led us to see that particular advert. Or we could be given information about the targeting criteria that we're being seen. Now, you can kind of start seeing that that's a lot of potential information. And given that certain platforms are kind of known for their sleek uh, um, aesthetic you know how would you start presenting that information to people in a way that's actually valuable and that there is not going to disrupt their experience and if you think of something like twitter there isn't a lot of information a lot of space under a tweet to be able to display why a, an advertisement that appears in your in your feed is there so there are a lot of real questions about firstly what information is it most important for the average user to see? And then is there a difference between what a user needs to see and what an expert needs to be able to access and analyze? And then there's a whole series of design questions about like, well, how do we design ways to make this information visible in ways that doesn't disrupt the user experience, but actually helps people to understand what's going on. And that's kind of where we are at the moment. I think, Current debates are really trying to work out you know, what we need to tell people and how we tell it. And there aren't clear answers here, but I've seen some really interesting prototypes of things where you, know, you have some, um, a pop-up on Facebook potentially saying, you know, 1% of people in um, your local area are seeing this advert. And you know, that kind of information could help people understand that they are getting a really micro-targeted message. 
and um, could be a simple um, you know, strap line along the bottom of an advert which wouldn't take up much um, space online. At the moment I'm quite interested in, in what we can tell from the advertising archives that we've got and the information that is in the public realm. Um, and I think that's interesting because you know we can tell a number of things actually about what advertisers are doing and why that might be problematic. So looking to um, do some work at the moment with advertisers and with campaigners about you know what they think they're doing with advertising and then how people perceive and uh, understand the impact of advertising. So I think there's some really interesting questions about that and what we can tell from what we know about advertising. But what I'm starting to think about as um, we go forward is actually you know what's beyond this because there's a real danger um, for researchers and you know, wider people who are offering commentary about what's happening online in that we look at the available data. And what's been great with Facebook creating an advertising archive and Google doing similar is that we now have this new information to look at and to be able to understand um, some insights about what's happening with targeting online. But that is a tiny fraction of the online space. You know, Firstly, advertising is only one arena in which in which micro targeting can play out. You know, it's possible, for example, to use um, geolocation data uh, off our phone to target us with messages. You know, not through advertising, but potentially through like push notifications, or to you know, if you're following um, someone on social media, you could potentially get organic content, which is you know, a post that's generated by um, the specific person that you're following that's trying to push you with a certain message based on your geographic location at that point in time. You know, there's this whole other world beyond advertising where micro-targeting can play out. And we're not really looking at that yet. And I think that's got to be really important. Um, but then I also think, you know, it's, it's really important to think about other platforms as well. So Facebook and Google are obviously very dominant and they have a really big percentage of the market. But I think, you know, there's other places in which micro-targeting can happen. There is really interesting developments about what's going on, for example, um, through kind of television, especially um, like pay-to-view services like Netflix or Now TV, you know, that, that have the potential to integrate advertising or to target specific messages. Um, you know, even services like Spotify that use kind of recommendation systems, you know, they could target you with different, um, with different content dependent on the information that they hold around you. So there is a much wider uh, sphere of analysis that we need to be looking at when we're thinking about micro-targeting, uh, which isn't just necessarily what happens at elections, but, you know, how data is used and how as citizens companies are utilizing our data in ways that affect our everyday life. I think those are really, really important questions that we need to start thinking about. The thing I find so interesting is that the solution is gonna be slightly different in every different place. You know, either whether that's because we've got different existing um, legislative and regulatory frameworks in different countries, but also there's just loads of cultural differences about what is and isn't acceptable. So there isn't gonna be a universal solution to these questions, but I think these questions are important for every different country to be asking at the moment. There are really under-researched areas, um, but I think that the reason they're under-researched is because we have a real lack of data to be able to actually study it. I know in my own group, um, work, it's really frustrating. You, know, you, you set out with a question, and your ability to be able to answer that question is just hindered by the fact we don't have information about what's happening online. It's, it's a real black box. You know, we've ended up very reliant on these advertising archives for a reason. It's because there isn't a lot of data available through other mediums. Um, so I think that, I think there are gaps and I don't necessarily know, think there's easy ways that we can, um, can start looking at them because, you know, we need big companies um, to open up and to provide more access to researchers to be able to dig into these things. You know, so thinking about, you know, what percentage of content online um, is seen by a really small audience? You know, do different platforms have different kind of norms in terms of the degree to which there's like universal content or micro-targeted content? I think, you know, building up an understanding of where the good practices are and um, you know, where poorer practices can be found is a really important way of thinking 
about how we progress here. Um, but I do think that, you know, that question of like, what does good design look like and how do we actually convey to people what is important here? There are not many people thinking about that at the moment. And I think that's where the debate has got to. So we, we do need more work that's trying to test and prototype different ideas and responses to what's going on. Really interesting. Um, and yeah, thanks for coming on. <laughs> You're very welcome. <laughs>